exploring the Marrakesh Treaty's impact and digital accessibility solutions. Um, my name's Austin Stam, and I am the Accessibility and Assistive Technology Coordinator at St. Mary's College in Northern California. I am currently getting my doctorate in educational technology. I wanted to start by just acknowledging privilege. You know, there's lots of different, uh, you know, you know, you know in, in, in our country and in our world, you know, there's lots of different, uh, you know, ways that affect how we're, we're treated in society. And, you know, that can be with, with race or economic status. And another one that, come, that I think is important to kind of acknowledge too, you know, is when it comes to, to people with disabilities, a lot of it comes down to access to early inter intervention and having the resources and supportive parents there to help to help um, a child uh, with their de de development. And for me personally, I actually um, was born with very mild cerebral palsy, and I was really blessed to have a really supportive um, household and 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 uh, parents who had the um, economic means to provide like occupational therapy, speech therapy. I went to um, a private school in Encino called uh, Westmark that specializes in helping students with disabilities. And I really um, was was just I just want to acknowledge that that it's that those those resources on uh, the way the healthcare system is structured, you know, is not available to to everyone, and that not that that can really uh, you know um, in, in impact who's able to access those resources. And for me personally, you know, I feel like all that th those services helped me become the person I am today. Uh, so what I want to talk about is the copyright law and the Marrakesh Treaty. And I feel like a good way to start is by thinking about the U.S. copyright law. So U.S. copyright law is based on the Chafee Amendment, which was introduced in uh, 1996. And the amendment per permits the reproduction of literary and musical works for people with a reading disability. And reading disability is purposely broadly defined, and it basically it, it, uh, relates to any uh, difficulty with reading. So that can, uh, you know, be dyslexia. It could be, you know, um, so it, it, it could be, you know, blindness or, or, or some, you know, you know, something like that. It can really be anything related to, to that process of reading, which is very a very broad uh, term, which you'll see later um, is important because right now in um, our, our society still and in our world, there is a global uh, book famine still, particularly for uh, developing countries. The United uh, 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 Kingdom Royal Institute uh, coined the term global book famine. I think at that time, uh, it was even less than 7% of accessible books were accessible. Now, now, now it's a little bit higher, but um, the majority of books are, are inaccessible and that really um, was creating an, an issue because there are a lot of people with disabilities um, internationally who could not access uh, books. And uh, what was happening, you know, part of the problem is in these uh, other countries, you have the copyright law where there's no exemptions for people with disabilities to reproduce uh, works in an accessible format. So you can see like um, Albain Albania, Cambodia, Egypt, Gambia, and Zambia, they don't have any of these exemptions available. So there's no way to provide books in an accessible format. If you look at China, Greece, and Cameroon, they only have an exemption for people with blindness. And I'm actually gonna go into China a little bit because they're kind of an interesting one to think about. Uh, China currently um, has made physical braille the only permissible format um, for um, you know for 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 uh, reproduction, but the problem with that is not all people um, who are are blind even can read Braille. And then again, when you're focusing um, only on on blindness, it leaves out people with dyslexia and other other and other reading difficulties. What ended up happening? Well, there were some volunteers who were basically breaking the law and trying to to to, to distribute audiobooks uh, to people with reading disabilities. And that sort of led to the governmental agencies in China now actually providing uh, audio books and physical braille um, to patrons of their libraries, which is a really you know, good move forward, but it's not as broad as you'll see as the countries who have joined uh, the Marrakesh Treaty. Um, there are other countries that are making um, steps uh, toward inclusion. 
Uh, the European Union, Australia, United Kingdom, and New Zealand consider anyone with a disability qualified for an accessible format. And Singapore's copyright law makes an exemption for anyone who has difficulties manipulating a physical book. I think one thing I'm going to note here is I think I may have, I, I just want to uh, mention that um, I'm, I'm doing the Marrakesh Treaty, I'm focusing on that because I recently, uh, with Dr. Hesu, I had an article published in uh, Tech Trends. And uh, that uh, is um, where, the, where, where this information is coming from, just if you're curious. And I think in the presentation link um, on, at the bottom there, there should be in that, in that Google Doc uh, of resources, there should be a link to the article. Um, so if you're interested afterward, you, you can check it out. But basically, um, you know, the European Union, Australia, United Kingdom are some of the countries that, are, that have, have, have uh, broader adaptations of um, you know, uh, you know, for for exemptions, and they're really thinking about things like manipulating the book and just even broader than just a you know difficulty reading. Then you have uh, you know what happened with how the Marrakesh Treaty was formed, and that's through the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, Two thirds of, of the countries had restrictive copyright law. These are uh, delegates, um, you know, you know, for the WIPO. And they all gathered in Marrakesh and they signed the Marrakesh Treaty in 2013. It became effective in 2016. And basically, the Marrakesh Treaty um, broadens uh, any country's uh, copyright law who ratifies the treaty. And what it basically does is it, it's based on the Chafee Amendment of the US copyright law. And it allows government agencies, educational institutions, nonprofits, libraries to reproduce accessible works. And in addition to that, the, uh, the, yes, so, so I think there's something in the ch ch chat asking if it covers Im impairment. So it covers anyone with, who, who, ha who has a disability, you know, who has a, a disability and that disability affects uh, their ability to read. They are covered by the Marrakesh Treaty and are able to, to, to receive accessible books. So it's very much based on, on the Chafee Amendment. And then in addition to that, uh, the, you know, you, you, it really uh, also allows the sharing of books between countries that are, you know, that have ratified the treaty, which is, you know, really important as well. There are uh, nonprofit organizations that are participating, you know, with the Marrakesh Treaty, the Accessible Books, Con, uh, you know, Consortium, the Benetex Bookshare, they're all able to provide books to any country that's ratified the treaty, you know, um, Again, you know, not all the books are on these different platforms, but it does help because there is a there is a good amount of books of it, you know being made available, which is really important. A success story looking at, at the Marrakesh Treaty would be like Mongolia. Mongolia's original copyright laws had no exemptions for people with disabilities. Then they ratified the Marrakesh Treaty in 2016. Now uh, people with disabilities are, are able to access books in accessible formats. Um, and you know they're able to provide that at their libraries and educational institutions. The issue with the Marrakesh Treaty, and one thing to kind of keep in mind that I think is important to understand is that when you have, uh, there, there is still in developing countries, particularly a lot of stigmas around people with disabilities and, and discrimination. And that even though if you ratify the Marrakesh Treaty, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to see those, you know, what's being stipulated there come into effect. And you also have issues when it comes to the infrastructure to reproduce the accessible books. So for example, if you look at Botswana, Botswana ratified the Marrakesh Treaty, but they didn't ratify the CRPD, which is, um, you know, includes, it basically is a, a, uh, a, a, tr a treaty kind of from the United Nations that is encouraging uh, accessible, uh, you know, disability rights for, for people and trying to, to, to basically eliminate discrimination for people with disabilities, they didn't ratify that. And in turn, what that means is that people with disabilities um, in Botswana are still facing, uh, you know, stigmas and, and discrimination. So for example, people with disabilities aren't, aren't permitted to receive an education in Botswana or attend the schools. So that, that, that can be a major uh, barrier, even if the Marrakesh Treaty is, is uh, ratified by your country. Another thing to keep in mind is that publishers are allowed to continue to publish materials that are um, inaccessible. So the Marrakesh Treaty does not uh, pressure publishers to make their work accessible. 
Uh, I, I think, you know, when you, with that, that, that basically means that, that this is really about providing an opportunity for nonprofit organizations and, you know, government um, organizations to do that remediation, but it does not actually uh, force the publishers to do anything. What is kind of um, influencing publishers are the um, accessibility lawsuits uh, being waged by, um, uh, you know, like against higher education institutions. They're being more careful in the platforms that they adopt. And an example of that actually is the Los Angeles Community College District. Um, they were successfully sued by two students with blindness. A significant part of the lawsuit involved the inaccessibility of Pearson's My Math Lab platform. Uh, the, the, you know, they were mandated, the district was to appoint someone in charge of accessibility policies and to evaluate the educational technology of the college. There's an abundance of, you know, different lawsuits relate, re, re, you know, related to, to this that have, you know, a similar effect. But the point is that these are making colleges and higher education institutions more um, cognizant about what they're selecting when it comes to not only educational technology, but also in terms of their textbooks as, as well. And then if you look at the need right now, there's a need for a marketplace for accessible books for people with disabilities. You know, it, there a lot of, as I mentioned, a lot of the developing countries lack the infrastructure, they lack the resources for accessible books. So there really needs to be some place where those can be uh, purchased. And if you look at, you know, Bookshare and the different um, organizations there, a lot of them are volunteer based and they're not really, you know, matching the, sele the selection and, and quality as, you know, um, Amazon's Audible or, you know, uh, some type of iTunes for books or something like that. And uh, I think that in the future, what we need to be kind of thinking about is creating um, an accessibility label. Um, Robert, Martin Nango um, is, is like uh, kind of an activist for accessible books. And he was um, um, making an, an, you know, being an advocate for an accessibility label where across platforms, there's a clear, under, a, a clear delineation of what accessibility features are being included in books and other educational technologies. And I think that's something to really consider as well as publishers not locking their books to, to their platforms, but providing maybe an open platform where you know, there's a, a real wide variety and selection of books. So I think that's something to be thinking about as, as well. Uh, a big step that's coming in the future that I think is really exciting is the European Union Accessibility Act. That's gonna come into effect hopefully in 2025. It will require the major publishers to ensure that all books sold in Europe are accessible. Developing countries infrastructure and access to the internet will hopefully continue to improve. And again, you know, you're seeing uh, the higher education institutions be more selective and really consider accessibility as, as a screening criteria for what, you know, they're selecting. And I also feel like in the, as in the future, the way that the tuition's going and stuff, we might be seeing more and more colleges um, making books part of tuition. And I think that, again, puts a real pressure on publishers to provide uh, accessible formats uh, when that is done. Um, so I guess I just wanted to, to just see if there's any questions about this. Uh, actually, I have one more slide, then, but then, then I'll just check for questions and I'll, then I'll continue to the next part. Um, so basically overall, the Marrakesh Treaty is a step in the right direction. You know, ratifying the treaty does permit institutions to reproduce accessible works. It doesn't deal with the problem directly, but it provides a way of kind of working around it with um, nonprofits and educational institutions rem remediating inaccessible works for people with disabilities. And, you know, um, it's still not a, a true marketplace, but hopefully that will develop in the future. Any, uh, I just wanted to, to do a check to see if there's any questions about that. And then I'll, I'll I'm going to move on to the next uh, part. So I'm just going to check the chat for a sec. Uh, one second. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it looks like there's, I'll give, I'll give it a minute and then, I'll, and then I'm going to jump to the next, to the next part. But overall, I think the Marrakesh Treaty is, it, is, is moving us forward, but we really need to be putting the pressure on the publishers to, you know, make their books and works accessible. I don't see anything in the chat, so what I'm going to do is just continue, and then uh, you can we can uh, take questions at the end. Uh, so, oh, I see one actually here. Um, 
yeah, it takes it takes a long time for the countries to ratify the treaties. That is that is true as well. And it, it sometimes it, you, you can see actually on, on the on the website for the Marrakesh Treaty in the different countries, some of them you know either are in the process of ratifying or whatnot. But it takes a long time for all that to kind of get worked out. Um, so that's important to keep in mind too. Uh, so what I want to bring up here, actually, this is what I'm thinking of uh, doing my uh, dissertation on is um, online courses and, and executive functioning. You know, when you look at online courses, one of the things to kind of keep in mind is that a lot of times the assignments can be difficult to kind of uh, keep track of. And because it's really because it's, uh, if, you're on, if you're in an online course, you have to go to that LMS every time to basically access, uh, you know, the syllabus or the assignments or the lecture. And if the student's not doing that on a consistent basis or not keeping track or checking, things can be missed or have to be turned in at the last minute. So um, there isn't a way to really prompt you to do an, ass an assignment. When you go to a physical class, you're being reminded consistently you know, that, that you need to turn something in because the teacher's gonna write it on the board before you leave. And you're also getting that prompt by just attending. Uh, so one of the things that's being considered is how can we make these, uh, you know, these online courses more accessible, especially for people with ADHD and, you know, people have a hard time with, with executive functioning, you know, being able to keep track of, uh, you know, those assignments in, in, in a clear and, and, e and easy way. And I'm just going to go over uh, two studies here that kind of kind of explore this a little bit. Uh, so this first study, it was an email reminder study. And what the professor was doing, there was a, a, a lab where, where it was like a science lab. And in the science, before the science lab began, students were supposed to watch uh, videos on, online to, of, how, of how to do the different science projects. And the professor experimented with initially, you know, sending emails, but they didn't kind of have a standard heading. And then the professor uh, later standardized the heading, standardized the time of when the emails were sent. And that led to, to over a 90% uh, completion rate for the videos. Um, so I think that kind of shows that initially it was in like the 70s. So it, it, it basically, you got about a 20% increase by, um, you know, stand, you know ha having these reminders and being able to, to use them in, in, in a way where they're standardized and, and easy for students to access. Uh, this is other study I think is really interesting um, by, uh, by, by Mots, Mallon and Quick. Um, it's from the uh, University of, of, of Indiana. Uh, um, from, from actually Indiana University, I'm sorry. And Indiana University uh, developed this software called uh, Boost. And it basically um, provides uh, automated reminders to students that are pushed out uh, from the Canvas LMS and, um, right, right to their phone. So they get, they get reminders of when each assignment um, is supposed to be turned in. They, they did this experiment really looking at about, I think it was 24 hours, maybe 48 before um, an assignment was due, they would send out the first reminder and then they'd send out like one more, maybe like 12 hours before it was due. And it really um, was able to lead to uh, students turning in their, their, their assignments on time and, and seeing an, an increase of, 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 of assignments com completed. Now, these weren't specific to online classes, but again, I think that they, they could easily uh, be applied and, and would be most helpful, I think, sometimes in the online environment. The other thing that's interesting with uh, this particular study is there was two different experiments. So one was just looking at uh, no reminders versus automated reminders, um, you know, pushed to the smartphone. And you know there was a clear benefit, but there was even more of a benefit when the automated um, uh, reminders and um, the professor's announcements were combined. So in essence, the professor was sending um, a summary each week of what was what was due, and they were getting these automated reminders that led to the highest increase of turned in of, of assignments being turned in on time. So I think that's really um, something to, to to really watch. Uh, Let's see. Okay, cool. Yeah. So the benefits of, of the reminders is that if you can push out reminders from the LMS, it can help students stay engaged in the course, it encourages students to complete their assignments ahead of time and avoids procrastination. You know, again, if you can do the consistent reminders from the professor, that can really be uh, 
you know, is proven to be most useful and effective in conjunction with these automated reminders. And I really think if um, you if, if you're using the Canvas LMS, consider uh, Boot Boost IU, um, and you know it can be, really be a useful, uh, you know, you know, um, additional educational technology to you know to be looking at. So I think when you're thinking about you know design and accessible courses, it's important to understand that you know, we're just, you're, whoever's make the, the designer is deciding who's included and who's excluded from the course. And when you're talking about um, inclusion and exclusion like that, uh, you know, a lot of times people focus on, you know, s someone like themselves. They're not thinking about um, all the, collectrum, the, the, the collective spectrum of, of people out there. And that can lead to a lot of inaccessibility and people not having access. And the example that comes to mind is the Web Aim uh, Million study, which looks at the top, um, I think it's the top million or thousand websites, uh, and they basically um, analyze them and they see what accessibility errors they have. And they found over 97.4% right now of those top 1,000 websites have at least one accessibility error. The average was 54, 51.4 per uh, you know, homepage. And a lot of these things are about adding alt text to things and, and you know, being aware of the heading levels and contrast ratio. And it's just a matter that there's a lack of awareness out there about uh, you know, these attributes and the importance of ensuring uh, accessibility. I have a quick uh, video example here of, of just um, an, something, a, a, an inaccessible barrier being encountered and what it's like uh, using screen reading software. Uh, this is software like um, VoiceOver, NVDA, JAWS, you know, that, that reads um, what's on, on, on the computer screen. And, and the, the, really the reason that it's important to include uh, described, uh, um, this, include alt text uh, for images. So I'm just gonna play this clip. So you could see that that first image is well is well described. It's it's telling you what it's about, and the second one, you know, where it's just a JPEG, you know, file name doesn't tell you anything. Uh, uh, one second. Uh, <laughs> sorry, a little bit of technical difficulties here. Uh, oh, okay, could not hear. I will. Um, one one sec. Uh, let's see. Um, give me uh, just a sec here. I I'm gonna see what's. Okay. Uh, oh, could not hear. Someone said, "I think I have to give me one second. I'm gonna try and reshare with with the, with the sound. I think that's what what occurred. Uh, was I didn't I didn't enable the share sound. Um, me. I'm just gonna also just share the full the full screen to see if that helps. Okay, so um, let's see. So I have a couple of graphics on this page. Mark Sutton hands on a MacBook Pro image. So the first one is well described and uses an alt tag to describe what that graphic is all about. Now we go to the next graphic. Reader 042116.jpg. Much less useful. 
so that's that that first one there. I, I think now uh, the sound is working, which is good. Um, let me see. I don't know why it's, it's taken me out. Uh, let's see. I don't know. Um, So basically what I wanted to go to next is um, uh, uh, this book, um, Mismatch by um, um, Kat Holmes. And it's about how inclusion shapes design. And she says, ask a hundred people what inclusion means, you'll get a hundred different answers. Ask them what it means to be excluded and the answer will be uniformly clear. It's when you're left out. And so it's really important to think, be thinking about how we can include people and you know, there's a lot of ways of what inclusion can mean, but it's really clear. We all have experienced what it means to be excluded in some way. And this other quote's from the Pacer Center. And I think it really highlights uh, the importance of just planning ahead for, for classroom design. It says the most important challenging aspect of modifying classroom policies or practices for students with disabilities is that it requires thought and some prior preparation. So it's really important to be planning ahead when, when, when you're looking at these different things. Uh, so now I wanna talk a little bit about the difference between accommodation and universal design. Accommodation is really specific to students who are registered you know, with the disability office on, on campus. You know, it's about meeting a legal standard uh, for, for access for that student by modifying course content. And you're really ensuring, uh, you know, that students can participate by providing um, a specific, uh, you know, modification for an, an, an assignment. When you look at uh, universal design, it's not about a specific student now, it's about all students and creating different, different ways of accessing, course, accessing the course content that makes it accessible to everyone. And the real goal is creating a level of variety um, and access where, you know, there's just a variety of ways of interacting with that content. Um, so there really isn't a need for a specific accommodation. And I think an interesting way to look at this when it comes to note taking is integrating technology and computers into the classroom, you know, does allow um, the ability to really uh, use different avenues for, for note taking and also for implementing a note taking strategy. And then you also have the ability to explore recording and transcription software too. So there's just a lot of different ways you can leverage technology to make note taking easier uh, for students. Um, I like to use the PEO model, um, which um, is the person, environment, and occupation. You know, the person is usually not changeable, but we can change the environment and we can also change the occupation as long as we're um, meeting the same goal. And an example of that is if you look at a person, you know, the environment and the occupation, we could say the person's, you know, in a student, they're in class and the environment they're gonna be using is pencil and paper and the occupation is to take notes. Um, and, you know, a lot of times the note taking itself is something that we, where is, is what the end goal is, but we can facilitate that in different ways. And you could use, instead of a regular paper and pencil, you could use something like a smart pen where you're getting the, the recording and you're being able to, to write down, every, you, know, um, you, know, every, you know, what your, your notes as well. Or you could use something uh, like typing. And with typing, uh, you know, that, you know, that's changed the actual process, but you're still meeting that end goal of taking notes. And I think when you're thinking about universal design for note taking, it's important to be, to be trying to include technology like computers in the classroom, along with, you know, pencil and, and regular uh, note taking strategies too. I know a lot of professors, you know, want to ban computers from the classroom because they think they're a distraction and, you know, students can go on social media and that type of stuff. But I think it's important to be thinking about ways you can integrate computers in the classroom that can enhance the learning experience. Because there are activities that could probably benefit from the use of technology. You can use the computers to foster greater engagement and community in the classroom, particularly through small group projects and those types of things. And I think if you're a professor who, or, or, or a teacher who really doesn't want to use computers in the classroom, at least putting in some type of statement in the syllabus or 
you know, in your first week of class, you know, saying that if you really need to access technology because of an emergency or you would like to use your computer to type, please let me know. Something like that is important to include, especially because if you, if you just do a blanket ban, you're really outing students with disabilities as well in the class. So I really think that having um, some inclusion to, to tech is, is definitely important. Another thing that you can consider, you know, is recording class lectures. Uh, you know, it's really easy to, to, to do, to use a phone to record, um, you know, uh, and you also have now with the ability if you're hosting like a Zoom class or, you know, like this presentation is being recorded, you're able to kind of go in and have, uh, you know, that ability uh, through, through Zoom as well as providing a, a transcript too, which is really nice. And this can alle alleviate stress for students and can allow them to focus more on participating in the class. You know, you're not so worried about what the teacher's saying if you know you're going to be getting a recording afterward or behaving, being able to see a transcript of what the key points are. So I think that's really important. Um, I think a lot of you are probably familiar with the Otter AI. I feel like the videos have been a little bit glitchy, so I'm just going to, I was going to try and skip, but uh, can I? Uh, okay, I guess it's. I, I the, like Otter AI is a transcription software and it basically uh, is what's used for like the Zoom captioning uh, that they, they, Zoom is contracted with with Otter AI and basically you get a full uh, transcript, you know, you, you could actually in the Zoom if you click on the transcript option for this uh, presentation, you would see something very similar to this where um, you know everything's de de delineated kind of by time and little chunks, which is really nice. Uh, there's also, you know, the Zoom live captioning feature, which is pretty easy to, um, to activate and turn on. Um, if you have um, a, a paid Zoom account and you're interested in learning how to activate the Zoom live captioning, uh, ha I have this tutorial included in the Google Doc. It goes over how to activate it. So I think that's, you know, something to, to, uh, to keep in mind as, as, as well. Um, the other thing that's kind of nice with Zoom too is after your recording, you can enable a uh, full, uh, you know, um, tr audio transcript for the recording too. So if you go into your settings under recording and you check audio transcript, that will um, actually let Otter AI run after um, the uh, Zoom recording has been completed. And assuming you recorded to the cloud, you'll get an audio transcript that, that's fully searchable too. So that's another uh, neat option to consider. Um, the other thing I really wanted to bring up when it came to note-taking is collective note-taking. And I know, um, you know, there was a Google Doc uh, shared at the beginning of this presentation for kind of notes and things. And I think it's important to understand that you could, in that doc, you know, if everyone wrote one thing they learned from this presentation, you would have a, a really uh, good study guide that this was a, a test or something, you know, to look back on and know uh, what the key points of the presentation were. And I think that that type of way of, of, of utilizing Google Docs and making homework, uh, um, making note taking as part of the homework for a class is really important to consider because it allows the summarizing you know, of the lecture and it also then is creating this kind of engagement where maybe um, students can kind of take time to actually, uh, you know, really talk in class because they're not nervous about missing things when it comes to notes, which is important. And I also want to point out that, you know, a lot of um, disability offices for higher education institutions, we spend um, significant time and, and expense, you know, on, on providing note takers. Um, you know, at, at the college that I, I'm at, we, we pay for, for, for note takers for, for students. And, you know, if the, if the professor's able to use this, this Google Doc method where everyone's just writing down a couple things that they learned from each class and we're sharing it collectively, that kind of eliminates the need for paid note takers. So it's something as well to think about from a, from a cost standpoint too. And then you're, le you're leveraging this technology to make it more active. Like one way of doing that is to encourage students to comment you know, on, uh, on, on whatever note they, they found uh, most interesting or, or to just write something to, you know, to the different groups because there is um, a, comment, a comment feature built into uh, Google Docs as well that could be leveraged. I now wanna kind of talk a little bit about accessible slideshow tips. Uh, so one of the common things to be thinking about when it comes to slideshow 
slideshows is like the contrast. So like, you know, when you're making your slides, you want it to be as easy to read as possible. I know um, if you're by your computer, maybe you can read the, the, the words, this is impossible to read at the bottom, but I imagine if you're far away, you're not gonna be able to see that. So that's kind of an example there of the importance of, 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 of using um, accessible font that has a good color contrast ratio. And if you're wondering, well, how can I determine if my color contrast ratio you know, for this font is accessible? There's actually um, an app for that. There's the Color Contrast Analyzer. It's a free app that you can download. I have the link in that Google in that Google Doc, and you can um, you can use that to figure out um, if the color contrast is accessible or not for your documents or presentations. So I'm going to play a quick video here going over that. So this is the Color Contrast Analyzer. And what you can see here is I have this document that is very easy to read, just black text on a white background, and it passes all the different accessibility checks over here that you can see. Now, if I wanted to go over and change this document, let's say I go and I make the words here in red, and then I go and I take the little dropper tool and try this out in red, you'll see that now it senses that some of these have failed and it's failing all the different accessibility checks for the WCAG 2.1 standards for text. So you can see that you can use this to kind of learn what uh, font st uh, style color works best and is most readable and legible. So that's kind of an example there of uh, how, uh, one second, So that's kind of an example there of uh, what uh, of, of using the color contrast analyzer to kind of analyze the fonts and you could see that the red one was much more difficult uh, uh, to read ha and had um, a lower contrast uh, ratio, uh, you know, was, was, was uh, more inaccessible than the, than the black and white font. Uh, you also want to think about the styles that you're choosing and trying to choose a, a font style that's easy to read. An example of one that I think um, is important to, to, think, to think about uh, is like the open dyslexic font. This is a font designed for people um, with dyslexia and it has a, a heavier bottom. So that way that you don't skip lines and um, you, know, what, you know, when you're reading and that can be a, a, a really uh, you know, helpful uh, font for, for students that can be easy to read. Another thing to be thinking about is you know, when it comes to, to the images that you're using, you can see here, I have this image. It says for a fair selection, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. And, you know, it's a good image talking about, you know, there's a bunch of different animals like a monkey, a penguin, an elephant, a goldfish, a seal, and a dog. And the idea is that everybody climbing the tree is obviously going to favor the monkey. But in this case, what I'm also talking about is that there's no caption below trying to explain what's going on. And you know, it's important that you add in some alt text to your images or put a caption below you know, in text that kind of lets people know what the image is about. Otherwise, you know, you're not, you're not, it's not gonna be accessible, especially um, for students using screen reading software. And uh, you know, just adding this, this little, um, the, you know, just this little caption can, you know, can be useful as well as, as adding in alt text. Uh, when you're when you're making your slides, a lot of times people use the insert uh, text icon, but that doesn't tell you um, what the title of the slide is. So it's much better rather than to use the insert text to actually go in and choose your slide layout. If you choose your slide layout, you'll notice that there's always pretty much a title at the top. I think for all for all of these, and the reason uh, is is because when you have the, the title, that makes it much more easier to navigate for the screen reader. And then the rest of it is just treated as text. And that is a, is a better way of going. I, for one, was, was guilty for a long time of just using the, the text. I didn't really realize the importance of the title and subtitle. So that's something to definitely uh, keep in mind when you're making your presentations. 
Uh, the Microsoft uh, PowerPoint accessibility checker is a really good uh, feature as well for checking the accessibility of your slides. I have a, a, a quick video here I'm going to play that kind of goes over how to use that. So here is a slide. Uh, are you a dog person or a cat person? And there's an image of a dog and there's an image of a cat, both very cute. Now, what we could do here is check the accessibility. We can do that by going to Check Accessibility under the Tools option. When you click on Check Accessibility, there are a couple options here. One that you immediately notice is it says Missing Alternate Text. So it's scanning for different accessibility standards and errors. And the other one it's note noting here is a slide title. Now a lot of people, when they make a slide, they go Insert and then they go Insert Text Box and they add their text there. That's what I just did. But this is not a title, so for a screen reader, it will not read this at the top. It, um, it, the way it should be formatted is with a title box. The way you can get that is by clicking on the layout icon and going to title slide. If I copy this in to the title and then I delete this, we will have now fixed, if I go back to the accessibility tab, we'll see that the title error is gone because the title has been fixed. I could add a subtitle here. You know, um, I don't know if both are good or great. Uh, but the point here is that um, now we have these two images. And as I mentioned before, if you wanted to, so I could go insert text box here and then I could type in cute pug. And I could write a longer description if I wanted to, although if I was doing alt text, it should be shorter. So what would happen here is that I could put a, a nice description underneath of both these uh, pictures. The other thing I could do is if I didn't want to go this route, um, and I just wanted to have specific alt text, I could copy this, and I could go into the picture and do uh, click and con control click or right click um, if you're on a PC and you'll go edit alt text and then you can go in and name the uh, the image and title it whatever you want so I'm going to call it cute pug and then we'll see when we go back to accessibility that error has now been removed so I could fix the other one by saying cute cat and going into alt text and typing in cute cat uh, the other thing to keep in mind uh, as I said before is if you wanted to go back and um, use the the image under, you could do something where you, if you had a really long image, I could say, you know, see description below. And then you could go and make a new text box and have a very long description for the image. Because um, generally alt text is supposed to be about 100 characters or so, 125. So um, if you had a really long, complex image and you wanted to describe it, you could just do see text box below and you could write a detailed description. Um, so that's a little bit about using the accessibility checker. Again, it's under tools, check accessibility. So that kind of goes over how to use, you know, the Microsoft accessibility checker for a, a PowerPoint slideshow. And again, you know, uh, the reason that they that alt text is um, supposed to be short is because on the screen reader, there's no way to stop the alt text individually. So it, it will basically just keep on reading or it will just repeat and read, read every the alt text all over again. And because of that, it's important that it, it's, it's pretty, um, you know, succinct. Uh, so now what I want to talk about is some accessible syllabus tips. And again, this is kind of uh, from that same image of the uh, different animals lining up for, for that for that exam that only the monkey is really going to be good at. And the idea here is when you're creating your syllabus, you really want to be thinking about a wide variety of um, assignments and not just focused on just exams or just essays. You're really trying to capture uh, the whole person and understand that you know, each person's going to have their own strengths and weaknesses, depending on what the assignment is. Uh, I can also say, you know, for myself, I, I have, I've talked with professors to try and have, um, 
you know, when I, when I was growing up, um, I, I got my uh, bachelor's in film production and I would always ask, uh, you know, professors in the class if I could use film or, or, or you know, Photoshop editing in some form rather than a traditional uh, poster board project. So I think, you know, it's important to be a little bit flexible as well. These are some assignment ideas that I, I, I just kind of uh, came up with. Uh, one that I think, you know, one thing that stands out to me, you know, is a lot of times you'll hear professors maybe say, oh, if it's uh, teaching, let's say a science class or something like that, I can't, I can't get creative with that. You know, it, it, ha it has to be, you know, maybe papers or, or tests, you know, I can't do other things. One of my favorite classes actually was an anatomy class where um, I did a play about the stomach and I made it rhyme with my, with my group and we, we, we performed it about the whole process of the stomach's digestive system for, for anatomy. And it's very memorable to me be, because I came up with that, and that, and that creative aspect along with the rhyming helped me remember and made the test easier. So I really think, you know, thinking about how you can get creative, even if um, a project, you know, even if a class is, is, is more like a math or science or something, there's still ways to kind of infuse creativity with, with the assignments. Another thing, again, is when you're great, you know, actually weighting the assignments, trying to have equal distribution and some traditional and non-traditional ways of expressing learning is, is really important. Um, and trying to, uh, you know, be aware when it comes to students with disabilities, how can you modify the assignment? What flexibility can you, can you infuse in there to, to help with that? And I'll also say, you know, putting in um, a dates or deadlines page in the syllabus that's really clear of when the due dates are and everything is really um, helpful and, and important because a lot of times it can be easy for students to miss important assignments and things like, like that. So having that page there is, is really helpful. Another thing is the heading levels, uh, this is particularly for um, the, 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 the syllabus, but also in general heading levels and documents. Um, is what allows screen reader users to navigate, uh, you know, web pages and, doc and documents. Uh, so they're they're kind of looking at, you know, the heading level one, you know, tells you what the title of the page that you're on is, uh, you know, you know where you're at, and then from there the different, uh, the other the other you know heading levels kind of break up the different set, you know chunks or sections in the document or in on the website. So. Uh, you know, you want to be including some type of heading level structure when you're drafting your syllabus. A lot of times it's easy again for people to start making things in bold, making things underlined, and those that doing that without, de you know, designating the heading level means that the screen reader user isn't going to be aware of um, what you're doing. It's just going to show up all as one, you know, large paragraph chunk. So it's important to really be thinking of that and I have another example here I'll, I'll, I'll play for you. So I have opened Microsoft Word and I'm going to show you how to add heading levels to a document. The first heading level we're going to create is the title or heading level one. So what I'm going to do is call this a sample title. I'm going to highlight it and then I'm going to control click or right click on the heading level one option and choose update to match selection. This way the heading level one will match and it won't do the, the preset that comes with Microsoft Word. It will instead allow me to cut use my custom heading level uh, styles. Now for the next heading level, I'm just gonna call it a heading. And what we can do is I can paste in some paragraph uh, words and then I can go here and highlight the heading go over here control click on heading level 2 or right click and click update to heading level 2 so now we have this as heading level 2 you can see the last thing I'm going to do for this sample is make a heading level 3 you generally want to have no more than around four heading levels in your document so then here what I can do is go here for heading three, I can make it underlined, and I can again go to three, and I can click update heading level three. And now I have this one in as well. And now this looks like it could be a sample document. 
Now what's nice is I can then go here to the file and save as, and I can save this as a PDF. And if I save this as a PDF, I can have it read with screen reading software. So I'm gonna demo that now. You are currently on a group. To interact with items in this group, press control, option, shift, down arrow. Heading level one, sample title. Heading level two, heading level three, heading three. You are currently on heading level, heading level two, heading. Heading level one, sample title. Heading level two, he heading level three, heading three. You are currently on heading level three, inside of a page. Lorem ipsum dollar sit met, consecutor dipissing elit, maze nas fermentum pelentasque. You are currently on a text element, inside of a page. So that's kind of an example of using the different heading levels and how a screen reader user might navigate using uh, screen reading software uh, that was being done on a Mac. So the, the software was was voiceover. I think, you know, again, it's important to think about that for for the different documents being used. I, uh, I want to kind of close here on just like a word on like the PDFs. So, you know, a lot of times for classes, there's always uh, readings and PDFs and those types of things. Uh, but the PDFs are generally pretty inaccessible. A lot of times professors or teachers will scan documents. When you scan a document and you uh, just, just save it as an image-based PDF, it's not compatible with any screen readers or any text-to-speech software. So what you really want to be doing is if you're making like a syllabus or something like that, you know, export from Microsoft Word, and if you're using, uh, you know, text, uh, you know, from so something that's scanned or whatnot, it's just important to at least keep in mind that you probably want to perform OCR or optical character recognition on the document. So at least it's compatible with text to speech software, but it won't be um, accessible for people with screen reader uh, users because generally uh, those uh, PDFs require a higher level of um, accessibility uh, know-how and kind of, um, you know, some remediation st uh, steps to really get in there and make and make sure each part is accessible. Um, but it's a lot easier to make accessible Microsoft Word content and stuff. So I think, you know, choosing, uh, wor you know, Word documents can be better uh, sometimes, uh, you know, than, than PDFs, and at least in terms of accessibility. And uh, I think, you know, that kind of concludes uh, this presentation. Uh, let me know if you have any questions in the chat. Oh, I see. Uh... Austin, I'm not sure if your if your screen froze up, but but we need to um, we need to wrap oh. up the session so I can start the next room. Oh yeah, I, I I'm 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 finished. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, everybody. thank you. Austin, thank you so much. Yeah, thank yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, I, 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 I really in, in, enjoyed, uh, you know, pr 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 presenting. I hope you guys found it helpful. Awesome. Great. Thanks. Bye, everybody.